ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Confucius Institute annual lecture for 2018. My name is Ning Zhang. I'm the interim director of the Confucius Institute at the University of Adelaide. On behalf of the Confucius Institute, the Adelaide Festival Center and Ossetia Festival, thank you for coming tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the land. This land that we meet on tonight is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their culture and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. We also pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people visiting or attending from other areas of South Australia and Australia. For those of you unfamiliar with the University of Adelaide's Confucius Institute, i just say a few words. It was launched in partnership with Shandong University in 2007 by the Honorable Alexander Downer, the Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs at that time. Essentially, the role of Confucius Institute is to promote Chinese language and culture in South Australia by strengthening educational ties between China and Australia, supporting Chinese language education and increasing mutual understanding. Our team of local Chinese, uh, our local and the Chinese staff work side by side to connect South Australians with Chinese language, Chinese culture, and the Chinese people. Over the last 11 years, our institute has worked hard to promote a deeper, better, and more informed understanding of China in Australia. We've achieved this by working closely with South Australian government, schools, local councils, and businesses, and collaborating with external stakeholders such as Chinatown Adelaide, the Art Gallery of South Australia, Migration Museum, State Library of South Australia, and the Port Adelaide Football Club, just name a few. Each year, we run nearly 30 programs. And this year, we've done, a, we, we've once again had the privilege of working with the Festival Center in Adelaide to be part of their iconic Ausasia uh, Festival. Tonight, we are here to talk about the universal language of sport, and we are very lucky to have an incredibly well-qualified key speaker and a panel of experts to give us their perspectives on sports diplomacy, in particular between Australia and China. Now, Mr. Andrew Hunter is our key speaker this evening. Andrew is a former professional volleyball player. He played seasons in the French, Italian, Czech, and Belgian leagues, and also played for the Australian national team. Before becoming a professional athlete, Andrew studied at the University of Adelaide and at the International Relations School of the International University of Japan. He also recently completed a master's, a master's in philosophy at the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Adelaide. Andrew was previously a speech writer and then senior advisor for international engagement to the Premier of South Australia, the Honorable Jay Weatherall. He remains a member of the South Australian government's France Engagement Advisory Group, a position reflecting his experience and interest in France. Andrew started working at Port Adelaide Football Club in March 2015, and as general manager of China Engagement, he has been instrumental in taking the game of Aussie rules to China, orchestrating 
the AFL's first match outside of Australia and New Zealand when Port Adelaide played the Gold Coast Suns in Shanghai last year. Let's now hear from Andrew and welcome him to the stage. Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Jung. Um, it's a great um, privilege to be here uh, tonight to talk about uh, something that's obviously very close to, to my heart. Uh, I was at last year's Confucius Institute uh, lecture and, and listened to Francis Adamson speaking, and so I feel a great sense of responsibility this evening. So it's very close to my heart, I guess, and my engagement at Port Adelaide Football Club uh, obviously uh, elicits a great interest in sport between Australia and China. But even before that, playing uh, for Australia, my first ever game for the national team was against China in Beijing. Uh, not a great memory because we lost, but I also had the great privilege of watching my wife at the Beijing Olympics. So sport between Australia and China has been, uh, I guess, quite significant in my life, and it's a great... It's a great privilege, again, to be uh, doing something in that space with Port Adelaide Football Club. Um, sports diplomacy is more than sports exchange. I think that this year has been a really important year for sports diplomacy. At the Winter Olympics earlier this year in Pyeongchang, there was uh, a moment where the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea or North and South Korea walked together at the opening and closing ceremonies under a unified flag. They also fielded a unified team. Now, when one considers that as late as uh, 2016, North Korea had been testing nuclear missiles, and this was a very important moment between the two countries. These things uh, don't always work, these sort of gestures. Uh, in fact, uh, they had been tried before. In 1956, at the Melbourne Olympics, uh, East and West Germany actually marched together at the opening and closing ceremonies, and it didn't really change anything. The athletes apparently didn't really get on. They didn't speak to each other outside of the opening and closing ceremonies, and the Cold War sort of rolled on. Perhaps a better example, or a more similar example at least, was that in the, another Australian Olympics, in the Sydney Olympics in 2000, North and South Korea again marched out together under a unified flag as part of uh, the Sunshine Policy, for which uh, Kim Dae-jung was ultimately awarded a Nobel Prize for Peace. But after a few years, then things started become, becoming more tense between the two countries, and here we are today. This particular example this year, though, is significant for what has happened afterwards. And I think that sports diplomacy can be used in that sense as the first step, and the first important step towards stronger diplomatic relations. So this year, uh, soon after the Winter Olympics, there was a declaration signed for the peace, prosperity, and unification on the Korean Peninsula, an incredibly important step. And there have subsequently been three inter-Korean summits this year alone. The third of those summits, very recently from the 18th to the 20th of September, there was military issues discussed, and it was agreed that there would be new rules of engagement between the two militaries. Again, this is a fantastic development in the relationship that will uh, ease the tensions on the Korean Peninsula, certainly, and bring about greater stability in East Asia. There was also a commitment uh, in that summit for the two Koreas to continue to use sports diplomacy as part of their uh, evolving relationship. So they decided that they would put a joint bid in, North and South Korea, to host the 2032 uh, Olympic Games, Summer Olympic Games, which I think is a fantastic example of how sports diplomacy can be used. I think from, uh, from my perspective and looking at how it can be used from, uh, from Australia's perspective, uh, this is also quite limiting in that it reinforced in people that sports diplomacy is principally there to achieve a breakthrough diplomacy when there is a diplomatic impasse that can't be overcome if there has been political estrangement between two countries, then sport could be one of those instruments that's used to, to break the ice and to put things on an, a better footing. For Australia, you wonder how much relevance this is going to have. Australia is a middle power, and although uh, Australia has played this role in the past, whereas an active middle power has been involved in important diplomatic breakthroughs, how often will this reoccur and how limiting will it be if Australia just thinks as sports diplomacy is something that can be used uh, on a very rare occasion where Australia is involved in such a moment? 
Now, under the Hawke government in 1983, certainly Australia did play a really important role in the Cambodian settlement and ultimately it proposed the peace plan that was accepted by all parties, but this is a very rare occasion where Australia will be involved in such a moment. So I propose that Australia can actually use sport because it's so vital to our co culture and so uh, has such a popular resonance to have a much more expansive program of sports diplomacy, to use it on a more regular basis and certainly not to wait until there is that moment where it can be used to break a diplomatic impasse. I think before going too much longer, it's important to define uh, sports diplomacy and I think the beauty of the panel that we'll have a little bit later is that each person on the panel has made a really significant contribution to sports diplomacy in Australia, but they will define it in a different way. So certainly uh, what my view is and what Trent's view is could be fundamentally different, but I think it's important to establish from my perspective a working definition. And I get to speak first, so <laughs> this is the gift that I have. So for me, any, any phrase that uses diplomacy in it, it's important to recognise that this is the act of a sovereign government. So a national government would have to direct or implement or encourage the policy. So for me, sports diplomacy is a national government using sport as part of its foreign policy. I think in Australia at the moment, particularly uh, in terms of uh, from a policy level, but also in the academic world, sports diplomacy has been caught up in a, number, in a web of overlapping terms. Public diplomacy is, is one, and Australia actually sees sports diplomacy as being a subset of public diplomacy. Public diplomacy was a term that was first coined by a, gold, a guy called Edmund Gullin in 1965. He was the dean of the, of the Tufts University, the, school, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And public diplomacy is essentially a mixture of cultural diplomacy and, and public relations. So it's trying to use culture to project a really positive national image externally in a way that would be useful for its foreign policy. Another term you'll often use, uh, or hear being used in respect to sports diplomacy is soft power. Soft power was termed by a, gold, a guy called Joseph Nye Jr. in the 1990s, and he defined it as the use of culture, values, and policies to make other countries more amenable to your foreign policy. So he juxtaposed that with hard power, which is essentially military power. Again, in those terms and those definitions, there's no real sense that sports diplomacy can be used for mutual understanding. It can be used for mutual benefit. There's no sense that it can be used for a reciprocal arrangements or two-way engagement, which again I think is particularly limiting. And I propose that Australia can actually use sports diplomacy in a much more expansive manner in a way that would make a significant contribution to our foreign policy. Now, for Australia to be able to do that, there would have to be a recognition that uh, sports diplomacy can play that role, but there would also have to be an understanding, I guess, of the importance of using an instrument of foreign policy that has such a popular resonance, which is why I think sports diplomacy can play a really critical role. Domestic policy and foreign policy now is becoming increasingly blurred, the line between the two, and I think in Australia we've seen, particularly with the Australia-China relationship, then a lot of the public pronouncements and the foreign policy is actually informed by, by domestic politics. And I think in the last 12 months, that's, that's probably something that's been really unfortunate between uh, the two countries, is this diminishment of our relationship, not because these issues don't exist, they do, not because Australia shouldn't actually going about resolving this, these issues, they should, but playing this out in a very um, public place, in a very public sphere, because there might be some uh, political gain on a domestic front, I think is a very dangerous thing to do. But if that is a problem, then the best thing you can do is encourage its alternative. And the alternative is that we have a more engaged public in foreign policy. Sport is a fantastic way of doing that. And certainly at the Port Adelaide Football Club, the number of people that didn't have an interest in China necessarily, that hadn't been to China necessarily, but because of Port Adelaide's engagement in China has taken an interest, has gone to China, and they've come back and told stories which are perhaps far more positive than the impression they may have originally had, I think is fundamentally important. I think from the perspective of Port Adelaide Football Club, I would like to propose immodestly that what we've done over the last four years could perhaps be seen as a model for Australian sports diplomacy. I say that because we've been saying for a long time now that there are different levels that we're working on. We're working on the government level because we think that it provides a positive platform for the relationship between the Australian and Chinese governments. 
We're not working on a business level because we believe that sport and sporting events, and particularly Australian football in Australia, is a fantastic complement to a business relationship between an Australian and China, Chinese company. And we're working on a people-to-people -people level, which again, at its heart, I think is a, a really important, uh, holds a really important potential for sports diplomacy because of that popular resonance. So I just want to use a few examples in each of these three areas to try and explain why I think Australia could have a far more expansive approach to sports diplomacy. Certainly to use the working definition at the beginning for it to be sports diplomacy, it needs to be encouraged at least by sovereign governments. And at Port Adelaide, we have had uh, the great uh, opportunity to work with the governments of Australia and China on a number of the events in which we've been involved. In April 2016, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, actually announced our intention to play an official game, an official AFL game in China whilst he was in Shanghai. Now this was his first ever visit uh, to China as Prime Minister and it was the, the first event actually on the official program. But he saw fit to announce that Port Adelaide Football Club had the intention of playing that official game. One year later, or a little bit less than one year later, the Premier of China, Li Keqiang, came to Australia on an official state visit. It was a three-day program, a lot of events involved in that program, but he did actually come to a game between Port Adelaide Football Club and the Sydney Swans because they recognised the value that sport can play in the relationship. Came to the Port Adelaide change rooms, met with Chairman David Koch, which is surely on the bucket list of any foreign statesman when coming to Australia, <laughs> and he spoke effusively about how great it was that Australia was taking its national game and playing it in China later that year when he spoke at Parliament House on the 23rd of March. One year later, which brings us to this year at the AFL game in China, the former Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Stephen Cherbill, actually came to the game. Now this is a great thing for us because we know it's very important for government to be involved in China. It adds to the credibility of what we're doing. But when you th consider that for the eight months prior to that, Australian cabinet ministers had been refused visas to go to China because the bilateral relationship had been diminished, and yet the Chinese government believed that he was a platform that was positive enough, perhaps safe enough, for an Australian minister to actually come to the game is fantastically significant and a great contribution for sport to have made to the bilateral relationship. Even if it's just a, sm a small step, even if it's just the beginning of a thawing of the relationship, it's nonetheless very significant. The second level where I think it's sports diplomacy can play a really important role for Australian foreign policy is in respect to the business-to-business -business exchange. Now, Australia knows that China is an incredibly significant country for us in terms of our economic engagement with them. But we have seen in Port Adelaide and we've experienced how important it is as a business in China to actually complement the formal business meetings with the sporting engagement as well. It offers a very different perspective and it really shapes a relationship. Our most important uh, financial supporter is Shanghai Cred. They've recently this year agreed to a five-year extension which will make them an eight-year partner of the Port Adelaide Football Club. I remember the very first time uh, I met with the, the chairman of Shanghai Cred, it was something that was mentioned, it was highly speculative, but he was in Adelaide in 2015 in September as part of you know, his bid to win the Kidman cattle stations. And I got wind of this, somehow invited myself to, to a dinner. It was held in City Zen in a, in a private room, the 1st of September. And of course, when you've got a Chinese banquet style, which is, you know, people playing out the ritual that you understand and the different roles of the, the Chinese banquet. And I had the opportunity to, to invite them to a Port Adelaide game a couple of days later. Here, there were no rituals, there was no role playing. It was raw emotion. So you went from being in an environment where you can predict the, the manners and behaviours of people. We've got this guy that was you know, an extremely important business person in China coming across and giving high fives and he was shouting and giving hugs to the people that he'd never met before or otherwise. And that's the role that sport can bring. It can bring out the real emotion in people. And from that basis, we formed a long-term and important human relationship that has led to a really significant business relationship between Port Adelaide Football Club and Shanghai Cred. Now this sort of thing, again, was solidified in my mind in August. There was another big group and uh, we hope to be able to announce uh, a partnership with them in the coming uh, months, but because we haven't yet, I won't mention who they are, but they had a three-day program hosted by Port Adelaide Football Club. They met with the Premier of South Australia, they met with the then uh, Minister for Education, the Commonwealth Minister for Education. 
I find when you're talking about Australian politics and politicians, you're often using them before you put their, their title because we change so much. But anyway, he's, he's, he's still there. He's now the Minister for Trade, but uh, they met with the Minister for Education at the time. They met with the Chancellor of the University of Adelaide, and we had formal uh, commercial conversations with this group. And as you know, in China, when you're having that, that formal meeting, you're sitting on the opposite side of the table. But when you're at the football, when you come into the football as our friends, you're sitting next to us which says a lot and it really helps shape that relationship. In the business formal context, you're sitting opposite. When you come to the footy with us, you're sitting next to us. It says a little bit, I think, about perhaps, you know, the, the a cultural element. So you've got, you know, a very uh, Confucianistic and hierarchical uh, context in China, whereas Australia, we like to think of ourselves as more egalitarian. So there might be a minister there, it might be a chairman of the club, but we're all sitting there, we're shouting, we're enjoying ourselves and it's then when it was a showdown, which we lost by a couple of points. So again, there was a real empathy for what we were going through, because as much as we like to stay poised in these sort of situations, but the real emotion of being involved in that from Port Adelaide's perspective was seen. And that night, you know, the, the, you could start seeing the relationship building a little bit because you'd gone from having these very uh, formalistic sort of conversations and relationships to enjoying a sporting event together where the emotion is such that you're really starting to break down these barriers. So for me, Going to a football game in Australia is very similar to the Chinese banquet. It's very similar to the Japanese drinking party, the nomakai. It's very similar to breaking the, the bread in Arabia. It's something that we do to break down and to build these relationships, which is fundamentally important. And I think if the government encouraged that, again, it would really help aid and abet these business relationships between Australia and China. I guess the third level uh, that I wanted to talk about is the people-to-people -people exchange. I think that, again, this is really important. It's a, real, a really important enabler for effective foreign policy when you have a well-informed and engaged uh, local domestic audience that knows a little bit and takes an interest in what's happening in the outside world. I think sport is another great way of actually bringing people along to have a, a different uh, perspective of China and a better informed perspective of China. And certainly that has been at the heart of a lot of what we've been doing along the way. But as we're here uh, talking at an event uh, at the invitation of the Confucius Institute, and as we're here, which is embedded in the University of Adelaide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the emerging relationship that we've had with the University of Adelaide this year and what we're trying to achieve, particularly with the international students and the Chinese students that are here in, in Australia. I think this is particularly important in the context of this year where Chinese students in Australia have been much maligned. There have been a lot of comments about the role that Chinese students potentially are playing in Australia, which I feel is uh, ultimately very disappointing and disappointing for a number of reasons. Clive Hamilton, uh, in his book that came out earlier this year, referred to patriotic enclaves of Chinese students. And whilst I don't really see any problem with any student being patriotic, indeed, we'd like to think of ourselves as a patriotic people uh, in Australia. But this idea of having student enclaves, it's certainly not unique to China. Indeed, I think that it is encouraged by our attitude in Australia to international education. It has become very transactional. We're starting to refer to international students as being our ATM. It's very important for our economy. So what happens with these transactional relationships if you're not making the real investment in bringing them into Australian society and into the Australian family, then you're likely to get international students naturally coalescing around their different language groups, their different national groups, uh, and certainly their, their different cultural groups. But if this is a problem, if this is a, a domestic public policy problem, then what you need to do is encourage the alternative. And certainly I'm not seeing any of that in Australia at the moment. So it's very proud, very proud to be part of the Port Adelaide Football Club working with the University of Adelaide to actually bring international students, and particularly Chinese students, into the Port Adelaide family. Bring them into the games with us. Because as our CEO says so often, when a Chinese student comes to a Port Adelaide game and puts the Port Adelaide scarf around their neck, they're part of us, they're part of the family, they're part of something bigger. And certainly it breaks down those barriers that naturally happen when you're an international student in Australia and there aren't necessarily the programs that are required to actually give you a real experience of the society in which you're living. This wasn't always the case. In the first Colombo plan, the international students that came here in the 1950s and 60s, mostly from Southeast Asia, a lot of them were actually housed in Australian homes. 
So they didn't naturally coalesce around their own groups because they were in Australian families and that was their experience of Australia. Now that, unfortunately, that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore, but there are alternatives. And I say again, if we see this as being a problem, then let's generate some programs that provide an alternative to that experience. Let's enrich the experience of the international and the Chinese students that are here. So we're working with the University of Adelaide to do that. We're certainly working with the University of Adelaide to bring them to games and to welcome them into our family, but also welcome them into our networks as well. So providing internships for these students so they not only leave with an experience of Port Adelaide, which can at times be heartbreaking, particularly this year, but they also leave with some real work experience. And in an Australian workplace, that's fundamentally important. Again, if you know a little bit about football, you can immediately break down the ice, but you have an experience of Australian working culture which would be, naturally, very different to the one in which uh, you were growing up in China and you would expect if you do ultimately return to China to work. Um, in the few minutes that, uh, left to me, I just wanted to say one final thing about the importance of uh, the game. Um, the game was announced that we will play another uh, iteration of the annual AFL game in China next year. We're playing against a new opponent, against St Kilda, which I think is a fantastic thing. Uh, Trent, as you know from Victoria, the Victorian government puts a lot of effort and energy into international engagement, which is fantastic. So we know with, between South Australia and Victoria, there is a, f a great opportunity to build a significant platform that transcends sport, culture, business and diplomacy. This is really the dream that we have to try and build this annual event up. We'd like to work much more closely with the Commonwealth Government so that there is, I think, uh, bringing together these disparate parts, we really do believe that the sum will be far more substantial than, <coughs> than each of those parts combined. Um, we want to introduce some elements of uh, Aboriginal culture into the game experience next year and we want to work with the university and a number of different bodies to make sure this is truly the jewel in the crown of the bilateral relationship. So I'm sure I see people sort of eking in a little bit after I saw this speech because we're all here to listen to Koshi. So with no, with no further ado, uh, thank you very much for your time. I do believe that sports diplomacy is a fantastic opportunity for Australian foreign policy. And I think working together, we should do a lot more to make sure that it, it has a positive impact on the bilateral relationship with China. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was very fascinating stories I mean, and insights as well. We'd like to hear more. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to introduce our panelists to the stage. Uh, the first one is our, the chair for the panel today, uh, Shannon Byrne. Shannon has more than 10 years experience in broadcasting as a reporter and commentator for radio and TV in several sports, including AFL, rugby league, netball, cricket, basketball, and football at state and national level. She is also the match day MC for the Sydney Sixers men's and women's big bash teams. She covered the 2012 and 2016 Olympic Games the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games, 2015 Cricket World Cup, as well as hosting and commentating, commentating during the 2015 Netball World Cup. Shannon's experience with the ABC has been her work in the Northern Territory and regional New South Wales before she moved to Sydney to become a senior member of the Grandstand team. Shannon's passion for the sport extends beyond the professional realm. She played netball and Australian rules at state level and played state league basketball for a number of years. With an interest in women's sport, women's sport she is a committed advocate for women in the sporting industry more broadly. Shannon is also a director on the boards of Judo Australia and the professional rugby league match officials. Okay, Shannon, could you come to the stage? <laughs> 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 
Okay, now, next panelist probably needs little introduction, Mr. David Koch, or Koshi, and uh, he says he is affectionately known. Uh, I'll say a few more words about you, or you want to come first? <laughs> okay. Okay, but well, I'll just continue to introducing Koch. He is the co-host of Sunrise, uh, Sunrise on Channel 7 for more than 15 years. He has various other roles and passions, including Port Adelaide Football Club, of which he is the chairman. David is one of Australia's foremost business and finance commentators. Before Sunrise, he was a self-proclaimed finance nerd <laughs> who started to be an accountant and started as a cadet on the business pages of the Australian newspaper before joining BRW magazine soon after his, la his launch in the early 1980s. He still maintains his passion for money, mm. <laughs> writing finance columns for a number of news limited newspapers, including the Daily Telegraph and Herald Sun. David is also the host of Channel 7's TV program, Cautious Business Builders, which is owned and produced by his own family company, Pinstripe Media. David was a director of the New South Wales Small Business Development Corporation for six years, and he is patron of the Youth of the Streets, managed Koch Center for Youth at Macquarie Fields. Okay, now I'd like to, probably before I say the long list of the introduction, I invite Mr. Trent Smythe to the stage. Okay. Trent, uh, has a Bachelor of Commerce and MBA. And in 2011, Trent was appointed to be the position, to the position of Consul for Malawi. Is that the right pronunciation? Making him the senior representative of the government of Malawi in, South South, in Australia. In 2013, he was elected to be the position to the position of Secretary of the Consular Corps Melbourne, comprising 77 consular missions in Victoria. In addition to being the chief curator of Moto Classica, the Australian International Concourse Delegons, Trent is director of the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, which is responsible for staging the Formula One Australian Grand Prix and the Australian Motorcycle Grand Prix. Founder and the chair of the Sports Diplomacy Foundation, he is also a member of the Council of International House, a residential college at the University of Melbourne. Added to the mix are his roles as state President and National Vice President of the Ferrari Club of Australia. <laughs> okay, last but not the least, we invite academic Associate Professor Dr. Stuart Murray to the stage. Stuart is an Associate Professor in International Relations and Diplomacy in the Faculty of Society and Design at Bond University, an editor and author of numerous publications in the diplomatic studies field. He is the Associate Editor of the journal Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Stuart is a regular advisor to government and non-state actors in the use of sport as a diplomatic and soft power tool. He is also a fellow of the Academy of Sport at Edinburgh University. Most recently, Stuart published the book Sports, Be Sports Diplomacy, Origins, Theory and Practice, the first 
major book on the role sport plays in the international diplomacy. Okay, now I've handed the floor to the panelists, the wonderful group of people. Well, uh, thank you so much, first of all, um, for having myself, but um, wow, what a panel. Thank you to the University of Adelaide and the Confucius Institute for uh, getting such a wonderful, and I'm sure you'll find out in this next half an hour why these well-educated people are here about sports diplomacy, but what I will get you to do as well in this next half an hour, once we've had a little more of a discussion about this, we're going to open the floor as well for Q&A. So uh, throughout this, if you think of a question, there will be about 15, 20 minutes of question time. So please don't be shy um, and we will have a microphone to hand around. So just while you're listening to this, just have a little bit of a think if you would like to ask any of these great panellists a question. Well, we might start with Trent, because you were probably singled out in that speech there by Andrew, weren't you? Um, your take on what sports diplomacy means. Thanks very much, Shannon. It's a great question. In fact, uh, and I'm somewhat prepared for this question because I was asked it only last week by another journalist who said to me, tell me about sports diplomacy. And although it's a word that seems to roll off the tongue, it seems as though we've been talking about sports diplomacy for years, haven't we? but yet why do so few people really understand it? Why is it a very, very tricky concept to define? And I said, in my view, it's because it's a huge concept. She said, well, it's interesting you say that because my view of sports diplomacy was she had recently been to Brazil and she'd been to the Australian High Commission and seen the Australian High Commissioner running a program to teach kids in Brasilia how to play cricket, Australian version of cricket. She said, so I thought that's what sports diplomacy was all about. But then I hear you banging on about trade and investment and jobs and universities and the tertiary sector. So now I'm confused. And I said, well, that's the beauty, but also I think the trouble with sports diplomacy. We're both talking about sports diplomacy. It is and does incorporate so many different things. So I, I think that's where I come from. And, and my particular interest in sports diplomacy is to pick up on those trade, those investment, those B2B, the business to business, bits and pieces that, uh, that Andrew was talking about specifically at the end, whereas others may take a completely different view and say, well, sports diplomacy is, is most powerful uh, when it's sport for development, when it's Australia in Papua New Guinea or in, or in different parts of Africa where it's delivering a program around aid. They're both sports diplomacy, and I think that's part of the challenge. Stuart, you're the man that has been writing about this for some time, but do you find it's a bit of a buzzword? At the moment, have you become more popular in, in voicing your opinion? People want to hear about sports diplomacy? Um, it's, uh, uh, yes, is uh, the short answer. And I, I find myself similar to what Trent is saying, uh, being in situations where uh, people are saying this is sports diplomacy and, and I'm finding it um, uh, quite uncomfortable because it's, uh, it's something we haven't discovered before. But it is this, this broad term when you think about uh, the role that sport plays and the, the relationships between uh, nations, people and, and governments as well. Um, so it is a, a bit of a buzzword. Um, I started uh, defining this term back in 2011 um, and I remember the first conference I did at it was in Berlin uh, where people were smirking uh, at the, the term in the audience. Um, and in true sporting fashion I said, you just watch out, I'll, I'll get you in a few years time. Uh, now we're uh, doing all over the world. I did BBC this week. I was talking with Tracy Holmes yesterday about the Cricket Australia uh, saga, shall we say. Um, and so th anything you want kind of fits into this, this term. Um, I can define it simply. It's simply the, the use of sport as a, a means to, to an end. It's simply that. Uh, if you want a complex one, you can read the book, which is 112,000 words long. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get on to Cricket Australia in a moment if we can, but I'll just bring you in, David. How does it sit with you that you're a sports diplomat? What you've been able to achieve, what, what you've been able to achieve at Port Adelaide Football Club, yeah, you should a, be titled that. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm pretty simple when, I, when it comes to, to any sort of diplomacy, and particularly sports diplomacy. We're no different. Um, to cultural dis diplomacy, I, I see us as playing a role as connecting people, connecting two different cultures that may be uncomfortable with, with each other or curious with each other and you use sport or culture to, to almost reveal your character 
uh, and say this is who we are and we express that through culture and sport. I, tongue in cheek, anyone who knows little working class Port Adelaide, I say we are to Australia what the Bolshoi is to Russia. Um, that, we, that we take something that's uniquely Australian to the world and it gives um, another country a way of having a bit of insight into who we are because I think it's an indigenous game, it reflects who we are, it's fast, it's skillful, it has a bit of larrikinism to it and that's what really sums it up. And uh, um, importantly what, what Andrew was saying earlier as well, um, that I think between Australia and China, my father sort of, I grew up sort of learning about China because my father was an international coal trader so he would travel to China and in fact invited there to teach them modern coal mining techniques back in the 70s uh, when they were still in their mouse suits. So I grew up as a kid learning about the, the wonders of China and how it was growing and he always predicted would be the economic powerhouse. But you know, because of cultural differences, the Chinese don't trust Australians. Uh, for the first instinct. Um, Australians don't trust Chinese, um, but you put a, a football scarf on them and they're not Australian, they're not Chinese, they're not Sri Lankan, they're not black, white, sort of Christian, Muslim. They're a Port Adelaide supporter. They're, they're, they're part of a community. And, and I think that's one of the great joys of what we do is bringing those, connecting those communities together. Well, take us to the 14th of May 2017. How much work had gone into that moment with the first bounce? That was the historic day, that the actual yeah. first bounce of the, the match between Port Adelaide and the Gold Coast if Suns. You, if you really want to know the truth, um, during Australia Week in Shanghai the year before when Malcolm Turnbull was there, and we, it was really we got him to announce the fact that Port Adelaide was building links with China and almost a, a cultural trade business there um, and using sport as a way of doing it. We actually we had the dream of playing a game, but we really had no intention at the time of playing one. And Malcolm Turnbull, sort of just off the top of his head, in front of all the media came and said, and Port Adelaide is playing a game here next year, um, and uh, we think this is going to be a great move forward for relations between Australia and China. And, and Gil McLaughlin, who's the chief executive of, uh, of the AFL, I could see his phone light up, and, and it was Mike Fitzpatrick, the chairman of the AFL Commission, going, what the hell have you committed to? Then they blamed us and said, you put the Prime Minister up to this because we know you eventually want to play a game here and you've blindsided us. So we had to say, no, it was just a mistake on the Prime Minister's part. So we then chased our tail for the next year for, um, until we actually um, launched the first game there. And for us, it was a lot of learnings as well, a lot of mistakes. Um, sort, of, sort of Chinese culture doesn't really promote or isn't comfortable with lots of people gathering together in big groups to watch sporting events. Um, and drink as well. Obviously. Yeah, like, yeah. The well, whole, in, no, but it was well, a busy that, week, wasn't it? They were quite nervous about they were, the they, match again. They thought we were EPL supporters. Um, and to give you an idea, at Adelaide Oval, when we have 50,000 people watching a game, we have 54 police to monitor the entire game. For the 12,000 people in Shanghai to watch the game, there were 1,500 security people, and that was imposed by the local authorities. And at half time, um, um, the mayor, the Shanghai mayor, uh, said, um, this is very different to what I expected. This is all families, not hooligans. I said, yes, exactly. You know, it's very different to English Premier League. So it were, was very different and, and an interesting experience to get it up, but, but incredibly rewarding. And I guess, Andrew, in terms of the, the, the crowd support, I mean, as a journalist, we sort of honed in on the low numbers that had travelled or the locals maybe that had turned up curious. But for you it just wasn't about getting the supporters there, was it? It was a lot more behind the scenes. And I have seen something about uh, your CEO talking about next year's game and the possibility of maybe, is it 3,000 business people? Your, your suites are improving and more the business side and what can be actually done 
with connections and networks? Yeah, as I said before, I think this is uh, a fantastic part of, of what we're doing is to try and make those connections, as Koshi said, on, on different levels. And, and the game itself, I mean, there, there will be next year, I think the capacity will be increased a little bit. There will certainly be more St Kilda supporters being there. But for us, there are the two elements of in terms of the uh, local Chinese engagement is one, uh, we have some incredibly influential uh, partners that are members of bigger business groups like the Shanghai Entrepreneur Association and their capacity to bring uh, their partners to the game and for the Australian business community to come along as well is an incredible networking opportunity. But we also are involved in a school program in China, a power footy program that's now expanding into a couple of new provinces and there are already uh, over 20 schools playing it. So we want to bring those young uh, Chinese uh, high school students with an interest in Australia to be able to experience a little bit of Australia without actually leaving China. And that, that's one of the things we learned as well because while there seem to be a lot of empty seats, every corporate person who was in a box had to have a seat because the Chinese authorities are insisting on this in the stands. So all of those empty seats were actually sold but they were all in the bars and corporate seats watching the game from, from outside. So um, yeah, we're going to increase the capacity. It was I think 12,000 the first year, 14,000 this year, well 15 or 16,000. And remember uh, China doesn't have many ovals, they have lots of rectangles. So the ground we play on is a 1930s army parade ground, that's how it started, that uh, became derelict the first time I saw it and was used as a golf driving range. So we had these turf consultants for a year, had to change the whole thing. Again, it's a logistical nightmare. Trent, when you, you hear this, and I guess also Stuart, but when you hear this, Trent, this model is pretty impressive. And you work with not only the Formula One, but your own company with the sports diplomacy. With your work with the Formula One, I had a look at your 49 corporate sponsors, and one is a great Chinese uh, electrical company, one of the leading ones Can in terms of TV supplies, Chick, in case you don't know. But yes, um, you know, when you hear of these great things that just a club has been able to do, Andrew touched on that it's a lot to do with relationship with government. What level do you think, if people are listening in terms of even sports clubs, organisations, what level do you think that you could be able to start this yourself? Uh, what, 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 listening to David speaking then, Fee was fantastic. What I like is in 2015, when we did our very first sports diplomacy function at the Formula One Grand Prix, and Stuart Murray was there and he spoke, uh, we helped DFAT launch their 2015 to 2018 sports diplomacy vision white paper. And it was a fantastic document. And, and I've sort of been on the record a couple of times of saying that it was a bit like a cookbook that had this fantastic picture of a wedding cake on the front and a list of ingredients but no recipe, no instructions. So when I listened to David and, and Andrew explaining what they did in Shanghai, the way, in other words, they interpreted sports diplomacy can be very, very differently to the way we interpreted sports diplomacy. And I think that's what's terrific. It's, it's, it's different groups, clubs, codes, peak bodies having a crack at what they believe sports diplomacy is. Now at the Formula One Grand Prix, you touched on sponsorships. Formula One is, is, is a, a, a sport that attracts globally a lot of money and a lot of sponsors. And one of the things that we're really interested in doing with our sports diplomacy programs at the Grand Prix is making sure that we connect those global sponsors with Australian businesses and importantly with Australian tertiary institutions. It's no surprises here that we're guests here at the University of Adelaide. All of the Formula One and MotoGP sports diplomacy programs that we've had always have a tertiary partner at the table. We've had some fantastic support from Monash, from RMIT, from Melbourne University, Deakin, VU, you name it. All the tertiary institutions get behind it, which is terrific. So one of the things that I think about when I think about sports diplomacy is the Victorian government, but they're not unique, but the Victorian government has a particularly large network of what they call VGTIs or Victorian government trade and investment offices around the world. I think there's 22 at last count. 
when I talked to the minister, I said, you know, there's 77 or 78 consulates in Melbourne, which can be thought of as the equivalent of Victoria's 22 VGTIs, but there's 76 of them in Melbourne, and how are we engaging with them? Now, all of a sudden, Formula One comes to town with its hundreds of sponsors, and it doesn't take much to really look down the list of those sponsors and see the synergies. And one of the easy ones that perhaps Shannon's referring to is a company called Silana, most people have probably never heard of Silana. It's a small company that sponsors a very, very important Formula One team, uh, Sauber Alpha. It's an important team because it's where Charles Leclerc, Formula One driver, just came from to now drive uh, for Ferrari, which is the team that Daniel Ricciardo was trying to drive for. So it's all a very interesting story. Silana is an advanced semiconductor manufacturer that's based in Brisbane in Australia, and yet they sponsor one of the most important Formula One teams. So what we do and what we're trying to do is just apply a little bit of the, the common sense, if you like, that you apply in your own business, but to our sporting events. And so David, in particular, who who's, has an interest in business, the, the, the way that he would conduct his business and the way that we've been conducting some of these sporting events, there's some real synergies there. And we're finding that we're increasing I say the yield or, or the output, if you like, of our sporting events by just looking for these synergies. So that's how that's how we do it, and you can do it at, at any level. And Stuart, I guess you know from what the Port Adelaide Football Club, as David has touched on as well, you know, sort of being that family club, but where they've come from, their roots from um, Port Adelaide. How can something like Cricket Australia at the moment and what's happening with them affect sports diplomacy globally? Well, I, I knew it had to come up uh, at some point, <laughs> and what a week! Um, great stories, of course. But but I think this is is the cricket Australia story is instructive, and it relates back to uh, what Poor's doing. Uh, Diplomacy is about representation, and it's about uh, how people uh, see us, and how we see others, and how we see ourselves as well. Uh, and this is why sport is such a a good vehicle. There's there's no point pretending Australia doesn't have, have problems in sport. Every country does. Uh, sport does have a, a dark side, and we call that actually sports anti-diplomacy, uh, to use a, another academic term. Um, but what, it, what sport does, it's an aspirational thing. It offers hope in a hopeless world. Um, what the, the work that Port Adelaide is doing, and many others, I should say as well, Football Federation Australia, um, Swimming Australia, Tennis Australia, all of these organisations have an international presence, and all the, the sports diplomacy strategy is done, which incidentally is the world's first, has given these uh, non-state sporting actors a, a language to, to talk about their activities. And the point of the, the Australian government strategy was to try and join the dots uh, to, to basically uh, represent uh, Australia's massive sporting footprint and um, to make sure it speaks with one voice and it showcases these beautiful qualities about Australia um, where uh, there is uh, equality, there is, um, it's a great country for, for women's uh, sport. Um, we, we've got bad press about immigration, for example, justifiably so, if you think about Nauru and the children. Um, but the story of Magic Daw, for example, is a, a Sudanese immigrant who came here and uh, has achieved uh, some of the greatest things. So it's about using sport as a vehicle, vehicle to tell the, the correct stories about Australia. That's the power in it. And it, it can reflect your brand. The, the biggest sort of uh, one of the big learnings that, that we've had is brand Australia in China is so powerful. It is extraordinary. Australia stands for healthy living, quality products, a vitality. It is, it is, put Australia, I'm um, sort of suggested PAFC should be Port Australia for a football club, but no. Um, but, but, but Australia is, is just wrapped up in um, in in this gloss in uh, uh, in China, and so it becomes a uniqueness. Um, we were, one of the learnings we had was we had lunch with the um, the education minister of um, sports and education minister in Shanghai, and and I asked him what what do kids do for Saturday sport over here. And he looked at me and he said, well, there's no Saturday sport. They go to tutoring. Uh, they go to music tutoring or mass tutoring or whatever. So don't try and start Saturday sport in Shanghai. He said, but what you should do is start school holiday camps and um, that where kids can come and learn AFL. And you promote the fact it's Australian, promote the fact it's sport and healthy lifestyle and living, 
and also promote the fact that only English will be spoken. So mums will go healthy, sport, Australia, and will be good th for their English. So it's, you know, it's, it's a two-way street in terms of learning the culture, and it's been fascinating. You just touched on Tennis Australia. They're actually this weekend in Shanghai. Um, they've got a huge sponsor for the Australian Open coming up, and um, to, uh, on Sunday they have uh, got some phenomenal things. A floating Rod Laver Arena will take over Columbia Circle's swimming pool. Uh, it's just going to be a phenomenal uh, opportunity, and uh, yes, Tennis Australia uh, actually in Shanghai now. So that's a great relationship that they've been able to pick up with a sponsor that they announced during the week. So, uh, Andrew, when did you realise that someone like the Port Adelaide Football Club could have a position like a China engagement officer? Well, I first, um, I was working in the Premier's office when I first heard that Port Adelaide was trying to engage in China and I think from the outside, it was quite difficult to understand why or to think that it might be possible, but I think the great thing that, uh, about the club and the way that it formulated its strategy was that it understood immediately that we weren't trying to compete with international sports. I mean, we weren't trying to, to take any space away from basketball or soccer or other sports because that's not possible. But the uniqueness of our sport means that it can be uh, a part of a, a broader cultural exchange and it can actually attract people to it because of its uniqueness. So that actually made a lot of sense, but it didn't initially come across when you're looking at things from the outside. So, you know, I, it was very hard to, to tell. I mean, Port Adelaide at the time was on, on a real high, so uh, you tended to believe everything that, uh, that Koshi was saying. You think, well, maybe it is possible because the, the, the club, that period was, was genuinely transformative. Now, progress isn't always linear, but we, we're reaching that stage again, I think, where we're ready to kick back up and, and consider again what is possible and where will the next step come from. And is the phone stop ringing or the door stop knocking for people wanting advice as to how you crack the market? No, well, rem remember what, what we did. We're the only Western sporting organisation in the world to play a game in mainland China every year as part of a domestic competition. Now, the EPL plays exhibition games there, NBA does, Major League Basketball, uh, Major League Baseball, and none of them have actually had the confidence or the trust that they could actually get up a game as part of a domestic competition. The NFL plays three games a year in London, never played one in China, and uh, since doing it, um, all of those major sports have um, said, hey, can we come and talk to you? Arsenal, who we have a close relationship with because they pinched our high performance manager, um, they've been playing invitation games there for eight years, are amazed that we have been able to attract Chinese sponsors to the Port Adelaide Football Club after their eight years, they have, do not have one Chinese sponsor for Arsenal. And I think it's that, that respect, that trust of having a competition game there that resonates so much with Chinese authorities. And it's one of the great things you learn, and Andrew's book brought to, uh, to the club, is this understanding that you've got to give before you take, You've got to show you're here for the long term. You've got to show you give them the respect that it's going to be a, pr a fair dinkum game, a proper game, and, um, and then you get the respect back. And it's one of the things that we've been, I've been quite criti critical of, of our government in terms of um, that whole Chinese relationship, is the power of words, the power of symbolism resonates so much more for the Chinese than it does for us. You know, we can be flippant and do a throwaway line and everyone moves on. Not in Chinese culture. And sort of some of the language that our politicians have been using has been, and I've top, um, nothing I haven't said publicly or, or, or told them, has been disgraceful. And it shows they do not understand how the relationship should work. I was just going to say, one of the things that I think is also most powerful about Port Adelaide being in China is it helps Australia and all the other codes as well. So when when the 
AFL is reflected positively in China, then more people are likely to consider, well, maybe we'll go out to the Australian Grand Prix or maybe we'll go out to the Australian Open Tennis. So, I, and I'm very much a believer, on the one hand, in competition. Of course, we need healthy competition between events and codes. But I also think this sports diplomacy has a huge role to play in us coming together as a nation and saying we all play as a, a we play fairly, we play at a level playing field. And I think it's what you're doing is fantastic for the country, but also for all the other codes. Yeah. And share resources. And resources. Yeah, yeah. Open offices together in Shanghai and we're talking to a few other sports of sharing resources to actually have people physically permanently on the ground. We have a staff of eight just on our China project, three Mandarin speakers, you know, we're serious about it. Stuart, what do you think when you hear this? Well, I just say the, the reason that um, Arsenal haven't got a contract is Xi Jinping supports Manchester City, so uh, <laughs> it could be, could be <laughs> one of the... One of the reasons in particular. Um, I, I, and so, you know, it's, that's the, the sports element and the sports diplomacy. And I, I think it's uh, bringing it back to the wider uh, China-Australia relationship. There's been a lot of uh, negative commentary and it's, it's quite dated, I find, to echo your, your uh, points, uh, David, that it can breed, the, obviously, the, the toxic culture of xenophobia, which has no place in the 21st century. Um, and I, I find that people look at the Australia-China relationship in a in a monolithic sense, that it's, it's binary, it's either good or bad, and they don't understand that it can be multi-layered and quite complex, that a mature political relationship, you can be opposed in one issue and together in another, and, and this is something we're seeing, uh, the traditional diplomatic relationship that's dominated by hard power, trade, and security. It's a difficult relationship, but the, the whole point of sports diplomacy and cultural diplomacy, as we're doing this evening, is to build other relationships uh, and layers, layers to that relationship around the traditional hard power relationships. So that's something that, uh, I think Port's doing is wonderful and um, many other uh, clubs are, are taking, uh, taking interest, but also the Australian government, I should, should mention as well, is, is about, I can't say too much, but it's about to, to do something a bit different with its, uh, with its sports diplomacy strategy uh, moving forward. And it's, it's going to be interesting, but... Oh, it's a time. When, when, when do we? You can tell us. Yeah, when, can we, when can we extrapolate uh, that? Yeah. Well, it's part, oh, part of the, it, it's part of the, the thing I can I can say is uh, the white paper 2017 uh, chapter seven emphasised the, the notion of partnerships that uh, the federal government needs to work with state and, and non-state actors in pursuit of foreign policy goals. So it's uh, Port Adelaide's uh, quite nicely placed, I should say. Um, Put in a good word for us. I will, I will, I will. <laughs> well, we are going to open it up to questions and answers, but before we do that, I would just say um, last week as well, I worked on the Invictus Games for ABC Radio, and if you want to see sports diplomacy as well at its best, uh, you know, ex-servicemen and serving men and women, uh, when you look at the countries, Afghanistan, Australia, Canada, Denmark, Estonia, France, Georgia, Germany, Iraq, Italy, Jordan, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Poland, Romania, Ukraine, United Kingdom and the USA. And at stages they were all standing next to each other on an archery range. You know, when you think about the history of, uh, of what the military means to these people and it was just one of the more fascinating things to see what countries were on the backs and the camaraderie. So sports diplomacy for me at its best was even just last week at the Invictus Games. But uh, I'll open it now to uh, the floor. We do have uh, a microphone, I understand. And if you just want to raise your hand and I'll get the mic, so I'll head to you first. Yes. And my name is Claudia Cream. I'm from the Chinese community, the multicultural community, community veteran community, as well as the legal profession. Now, the, I have two questions. The first question is, has the importance of sport diplomacy hammer to the state and federal politician? Because some of the politicians, they may still un don't understand what sport di diplomacy is about, okay? The, the next question is, now the grassroots, you're talking about the Chinese, uh, you know, going to China, and what about coming to the Chinese community? Because there's a huge Chinese communities here. Now, apart from the Chinese community, also the multicultural community is a huge community there. I don't think you have any problem, the PAI have any problem with the veteran community nor the legal profession. Okay, thank you. 
Do you want to do the first part? Uh, I, I might uh, take, a, take a pop at both of them, actually. The, the, I, was, I was chuckling away and rather sardonically arguing that many in federal government don't get diplomacy, never mind sports diplomacy, um, which would be an academic comment made from my every tower, I must admit. Um, the, I can give you a, an answer. I was at an event recently where the Minister for Sport, Bridget McKenzie, was speaking and she made a statement, for every dollar that Australia invests in sport, it gets seven back. Yet I'm still trying to convince my colleagues in federal government that sport matters. That's the type of uh, thing that we're, we're facing. Um, so that's the type of obstacles, even at federal level, from the minister trying to convince her colleagues. There was a report come out we just did through Edinburgh Uni demonstrating uh, that the, the value of football to Scotland is £1.25 billion pounds per year. Um, and yet we are still trying to, this, you get that, the gist. Uh, to the second part of your question um, echoes something. Andrew was, was me, uh, mentioning about the merging of uh, domestic and international. We even have a word for it in academia. We call it the intermestic foreign policy, and it means that there's a, there's a role for sports diplomacy, I think, equally powerfully uh, within Australia. There's a lot of estrangement between uh, immigrant communities, between diasporas, between uh, European settlers and first, pe first people Australians. Um, between Queensland and New South Wales, and so there's a role that, that sport can play in a domestic capacity in, in terms of bringing people closer together. Gee, all these terms I'm learning, I've got to pinch up the, my next presentation. He's going to get to it. Your next well, media well, release as well. I'll look at the media right, release and I'll go through it. Well, I'll just touch on that, David. So the AFL, though, is is focusing a lot though on multiculturalism. Oh, absolutely. We're, we have a multicultural round now. Port Adelaide has a multicultural cup of, um, um, for schools, uh, interracial schools to play against each other. Uh, we have power football in, um, in 20 schools in um, Shanghai in the region, going to 100 in the, in the next 12 months. So it really does, again, have a role to play in, in building understanding. And also, again, this, you play in a team together. There's the, um, oh, what's it called? Have you seen the, the new Australian movie on, um, on Australian rules football? It's, um, it's um, you should see it. it's very cute. It's a bit like the dish in the castle, uh, the merger. Um, perfect. Um, it is a great movie. It's on planes at the moment as well, if you, if you see it around. But it's this um, little town in, I think it's country Victoria, and um, it has a dying AFL team there, a club there. So they go and recruit refugees who have moved into the town. It is the most beautiful, funny, sort of emotional little film that Australians do. Uh, film industry does really well. And uh, it just goes to your point. It just brings communities together. It's fabulous. I'm Lee Stevens. I'm a friend and ambassador for the Confucius Institute, but also a power supporter. So I want to just make a comment and a question. My comment is that in listening to what was, what's being said tonight, it seems to me that the power of sports diplomacy, in whatever way we describe it, is that it's bottom up. It comes from the ground upwards in complete contrast with the official channels of, of uh, diplomacy, which are the other way. So in times when uh, things are pretty interesting in terms of relationships at the top level, coming up from the ground is incredibly important for the future of peace, of people connecting, of people really understanding each other as humans. So, and, I, and all the things that have been said tonight and watching the Invictus Games, it just shows you how powerful that is. And I think the time is right. People are now saying, if we've got to do something about this, we've all got to do something. So let's get involved. My question, David Koshy, is when are we going to have women's AFL in China? Um, well, there are, there are actually, can, I suppose I can talk about it. Um, uh, <laughs> there, there, there are plans um, that we've been talking to the AFL about having an AFLW All-Stars game uh, as a curtain raiser in, um, uh, in Shanghai. 
uh, well, playing on the same day. Um, we, we actually took, we have an Aboriginal um, AFL Academy. Uh, year before last, we took them to, to Shanghai to, uh, to play up there. There's, it's on YouTube. It's a wonderful um, video of these, of these Indigenous players um, uh, doing a dance on the Great Wall of China and a crawberry, and uh, it was just fantastic. Changed these kids' lives. It was, I, I, by sheer coincidence, ran into the mother of one of them in the Flinders Rangers Visitors Bureau, who uh, said, "My son went, and it changed his life. He was, he was sort of uh, really hard to control. Then came back from the, the trip and being part of your academy." Uh, and is now a training mechanic, apprentice mechanic, and has settled down. So, uh, again, that's what, what sport can do, not only interculturally, but into, uh, there must be a word for it, we're, 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 we're into, into domestically too, in domestically. <laughs> <laughs> our, our school program in China, both uh, both boys and girls play, and yeah. the, the girls love it there. Lee, I just wanted to pick up on your point too. At the f uh, we've done now five Formula One diplomacy breakfasts. We've had some incredible speakers from Sir Jackie Stewart, David Coulthard, Jacques Villeneuve, you know, all the great drivers. Probably our most um, uh, impressive and the speaker that everybody responded to the most was a young girl called Jessica Loveridge, who was a Formula One engineer for McLaren. And she just stood up and said what it's like to be an engineer working for a Formula One team in what is a quite a heavily dominated man's world. And for me, the real beauty of that and hearing her speak to a, a, a 140 women in the room, pretty much captivated by what this young girl was saying, for me, the magic was that we had a whole lot of girls in the room there that were looking at our event, the Formula One, through a completely different set of lenses. They said, well, I'm not really into motor racing, but I'm really into this message. And that, for me, was fantastic. My name is Natalie from the University of Adelaide. And over the last couple of years, we've really seen state governments in particular push forward in relation with their Chinese counterparts. They've established state trade offices. They've helped with the sports diplomacy initiatives and built their capacity in foreign affairs. We've also seen Victoria over the past week sign a memorandum of understanding with China to join the Belt and Road Initiative, despite the federal government not, not taking part. So my question is, through building capacity through sports diplomacy, can we see state governments come to challenge the federal government on certain issues of foreign policy? Trent, I'll, I'll, I'll start off just by making an observation that Certainly in Victoria, um, both our Ministers of Sport and Trade, Minister Aaron and Minister Deladakis, have very much led that charge uh, and not waited for direction from their counterparts at, at a federal level and have very, very much taken uh, those sorts of uh, issues and matters and driven them. And I must say that that's been a privilege to be able to work with. And it's not just the Victorian Government, but I do believe that, that many of these initiatives should and ought to be run and initiated at that state level. Um, uh, Philip Daladakis, I, I agree, has been extraordinary. He's come to our last two games um, uh, for the last two years, been a huge supporter, um, really put a lot of pressure on us to, to choose a Victorian team uh, because he understands what it's like. Um, and certainly the South Australian Governor as well, Stephen Marshall, um, has really brought a new energy, as Jay did uh, previously. So yeah, I think state governments can do it, and it's a bit like business as well. I, I found it fascinating at the game this year, despite the, ten the political tensions between the two countries, and diplomatic circles in Shanghai were stunned that um, Chobo, Federal Minister Chobo, Daladakis and Stephen Marshall uh, received invitations to uh, to visit China because there'd been a nine-month freeze. This was a bit of a thawing, an olive branch from the Chinese. But the business connections were still as powerful as ever. And it, um, we had, I think it was 1,500 trade delegates uh, this year, 2,000. 
and the equivalent of the Chamber of Commerce in, in uh, China said, for every delegate you bring up, we will match them with two of our members in the same industry or potential suppliers. Now, that's, that's wonderful because it just builds networks. So there's all this business networking going over, while up here, politically, it was, it was freezing over. And both sides, um, in terms of Chinese and Australian business people, were saying, yeah, we've just got to get through this. Trade keeps on going. They'll sort themselves up there, but we can make a difference down here. So I think it's business and state-wise is really important to, uh, to overcome what, you know, the tantrums at the top. You might just take one more question if there is one. Hello, my name's Stephen. I'm from the University of Adelaide. And I was just wondering, I guess we speak about um, the sport diplomacy being a bottom-up approach. Um, and I was just wondering what the, the changes maybe have been in from power fans um, in their perceptions um, towards Chinese, uh, uh, that, that foreign relation, because you know, we see the domestic policy uh, politics um, quite often impacting that relation at, um, um, at federal level, and I mean, I was at, um, I was at, I remember I was at the game where Chen uh, kicked his first goal for in the SANFL reserves. And I was just wondering, um, and obviously with the the power schools as well, there's sort of um, this idea of um, us helping um, the Chinese, and whether that sort of um, positionality can be perhaps maybe problematic, um, and how we can um, how we can create. Um, a more, a, a amongst the Australian people, a more um, understanding relationship. You know, I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly first. We, we do uh, surveys to our members every year, and for the last two years, we've actually had a set of questions to, to try and gauge their, uh, their interest in China and their response to, to what we're doing. Uh, and the responses have been incredible. So if you imagine that uh, Port Adelaide Football Club, over 60,000 members, uh, one of the questions is, do you think a, a, a strong Australia-China relationship is important to Australia? 98% of the members last year said yes. Yep. So if you were to have a similar survey to, um, uh, to a different demographic, uh, or those um, people that perhaps hadn't had that really positive experience of China as our members have had because of sports diplomacy or because of the fact that they're involved in the game, I suspect that that response wouldn't be the same. So uh, I think it's fundamentally important. And you know, whilst you know, 60,000 members isn't a small number, but it is a reasonably small sample of the Australian population, it just demonstrates how important that role can be in, in changing the perception, at least opening up your eyes to, to a different experience in different country and culture. Another question we ask members is, what are you, most, uh, what are you proudest of about the club? Our history comes number one. Number two is our China game. So, and then it's our local community. Uh, there's a real sense of pride that, that, that we're innovators, um, that we're thinking outside the square, we're doing something that no other domestic club anywhere in the world, professional sporting organisation, has done and pulled off. And we have 5,000 supporters, go, five 6,000 supporters every year go up for the game, and the stories they tell and to meet them and they say, I've never had a passport before and I've come with you guys and I cannot believe this country. I cannot believe this society, how big it is. They're just blown away and they come back with a whole new respect for China and a whole new understanding. And, uh, and that, that's what I you know, basically love about it. I want it to be a huge commercial success and a river of gold for our club and set us up financially for a generation. But to see the impact it has on individual members is incredible. And I'm sitting next to a, uh, a local Shanghaiese at the game and sort of can't understand each other, but getting on and joking and swapping sandwiches and all that sort of stuff, it's wonderful. And you have Chinese commentary of AFL too, yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal what you're able to do and all at club level when you're saying passport, you know, this is not going off to see the Socceroos or a national team, this is uh, amazing work. We will have to wrap it up, um, I know that you have maybe some other events to go to which is a fabulous time to be uh, in Adelaide with this but can I just get you all to thank this uh, amazing panel, uh, Trent Smythe, David Kosh, Stuart Murray and Andrew Hunter.
on behalf of Confucius Institute of Ossetian Oste Festival and the audience, thank you again, the wonderful uh, panelists and such a high caliber speakers and their insights and discussions will have benefited a great deal. Thank you again. Thank you for your time. And thank you. Okay, that concludes the tonight's event and uh, look forward to seeing you again next year in our annual lecture, 2019. Thank you very much. <laughs>